Hi, I'm Bernard Pucher and welcome to Center Frame Interview, where we talk to talented filmmakers from all around the world. Today, we have a special UK Film Festival edition where Luke Foster speaks to Prano Bailey Bond, who co-wrote and directed the fantastic psychological horror, Censor. If you sign up to our mailing list, you can get a 50% discount to UK Film Festival tickets. You'll watch great films, you'll meet loads of filmmakers, and I'll be there too. So I'll see you there. Make sure you go to centerframe.com or visit our social media to learn more. Now, on to the interview. Well, thank you for joining us today, and congratulations on Censor. I really loved the film. I mean, I, I came from that era when there was this mystique and intrigue around horror films, and my own love for horror really came from all those films being um, banned at the time and the interest that that created. Can I start by asking, was there a particular moment in which you knew you wanted to be a filmmaker or a particular film that inspired you to become a director? Yeah, um, I, I've i always been a massive film fan since I was quite young and used to sort of devour whatever films were on the video shelf in my house. And if I had the opportunity to go to the cinema, I would, but I lived in the middle of nowhere in Wales. So that wasn't always possible. Um, and I, I used to draw pictures a lot as well. I was really into art and I thought for a long time that maybe I knew, I knew I w was interested in film, but for a while I thought maybe I wanted to act. So when I did finish my GCSEs, I went and did a BTEC in performing arts. And it was while I was there that I got my first opportunity to direct a play. Now I'd been making, um, you know, messing around with a DV camera with my friends at home, but this was the first time that I was directing actors or, well, they were my classmates, but it was through that experience that I realized that I was much more interested in shaping a performance from the outside and the experience for an audience shaping that from the outside rather than being an actor in the midst of all of that. Um, I also don't think I was the best actor. <laughs> so I think that was something I learned on the, on the course as well, that I was a good performer, but I wasn't necessarily able to become a different person, which is what I admire so much about actors when they transform. I mean, I was very early on. So, um, yeah, so it was really that experience that made me think I want to be a director, but, even though we were working predominantly in theatre on the course, I was really, really interested in film. And I felt that through film, I was able to um, control the point of view of the audience much more. And also it related back to my passion for art and for images and the idea of using light and colour and cinematography. And also the way that I felt you could use sound in a more detailed way all of those things really appealed to me and it was really the craft of filmmaking and every single aspect of making a film that that lured me over and from that point onwards i knew i wanted to be a, a film director so after that what was your next step did you start making short films once you realized that directing was something you wanted to do I made a short film when I was living in Wales, so I must have been 16, 17 years old, taught myself how to edit on Premiere. And that was the short that I used to get onto a, a degree at London College of Printing. So I did a practical filmmaking degree there, which is where I met my cinematographer, Annika Summerson, and a number of other people that I've worked with as well, who are both directors or cinematographers or uh, production designers. Um, and then from there, after doing my degree, I went and I was a runner in Soho in a post-production house. And whilst working as a runner in post and in animation um, and building my way up through the ranks, I was always making my own short films. Um, so I was kind of doing the two side by side where you're working in the industry and gaining that experience, but you're still working on your own projects, writing, you know, getting films off the ground, building your team and your collaborators. So it was a two pronged attack in that sense. So what would you say you learned from particularly from making those short films when you came to making Censor? I think short films are really important for, for, for filmmakers because you learn both a, on the practical side 
you know, how to logistically put a film together, working on set. Um, you understand, you start to understand from um, trying things out, what works, what doesn't work. You learn so much from being an editor and being in the edit space, understanding, you know, what why a certain scene might cut together, what you might have missed on set. So there's all of that, like, literal experience that you get. But I think you're also building your style, what we call the voice of the director. Um, so essentially that's the style of your filmmaking, the choices that you make. Um, you know, you're you're building that visual language uh, that you want to use in telling stories. And you're also building your team. Like I said, some directors might only use different cast and crew, they might use different cast and crew across their projects whereas i tend to work with similar people across my projects i often will be for example on sensor you know my editor and my production designer i'd never worked with before and i met them through the project and you know that they were brilliant collaborations then Equally, I have people that I'd worked with across multiple short films, my cinematographer, my sound designer, my costume designer, my makeup artist, my co-writer, you know, those relationships I'd built over my short films and you create a certain dialogue with those people, a shorthand, um, you, you build a trust and you understand the way each other want to work. And I think that's really helpful. It's not to say that I wouldn't work with new people on future projects, of course, but I do think that's all part of growing as a filmmaker and and you know building building those teams and building your style. One of the short films you made was a film called Nasty, which was set in the world of VHS horror. So was that where the original idea for Sensor came from? No, the idea for Sensor came first and I was researching Sensor, thinking about this period, the video nasty era, and there was always a plan in my mind that I wanted to make a feature film about a film Sensor. But through that research, I was reading more and more tabloid press articles from the period and so much of the fear and paranoia was around what these films were going to do to children. So I... I was really interested in telling a story that focused on a child. Um, but I knew that that wasn't the feature film. And I started to think, well, if I made a short film that explored this era, it would be almost like a test ground for me to try out some of the techniques and ideas um, to see if the story works and also to use as a calling card for the feature. So they were the reasons for making nasty in a way um and also obviously because you've got something you want to say and, and a, a creative thing you want to get out of your system um but that was a really great uh experience in many many ways in terms of leading on to the feature um it was really helpful to show financiers that you know this idea could work um, to show the sort of texture of the project that I wanted to make and also for me creatively to have tried things out that I could say I love that I'm gonna do that in the feature for example some of the visual effects you know we shot on film with sensor we shot 35 mil and we'd shot nasty on 16 mil and again you know having those reasons having um tried that out with the short, I think really helped both the argument and, well, I guess the argument on both sides, both creatively and in terms of the reasons. So, so many things came off the back of that short, but it was always, sense there was always the, the beginning for Nasty. You wrote the scripts for Nasty and Censor with Anthony Fletcher. Can you tell us about how that partnership came about? Yeah, it was actually when I, when I'd had the idea for Sensor and I had a couple of other ideas for feature films in my mind. And at the time I didn't really, I suppose I didn't necessarily see myself as a writer. I saw myself as a director um, and I wanted to find a writer to work with on my projects. So I met with Anthony and a few other people. And I, I remember when I met with Anthony, I really, I really liked the fact that he was really upfront and honest about 
ideas and that's what I think you need in your collaborators you want people who are gonna you who you can trust when they say they think that something's good that they're not just doing it to you know please you that they're being open and honest about their opinions and that's what I really felt with Anthony but also obviously I read his work and I thought his work was great so we started working together and actually even though it was in sight of censor there were other shorts that came along so we worked on a short called man versus sand first and then we worked on the trip and then nasty and then censor so by the time we got to censor um we'd worked together quite a, a bit and now we're developing two more features together and i was really at the beginning more like i was kind of guiding or directing the writing process so i would take an idea to anthony put a mood board together um you know put something together where i was like this is the kind of film i want to make and he'd write it and then i'd feed into that process and then as things progressed more and more it kind of naturally fell into us co-writing so by the time we made sensor or started writing sensor we were really co-writing and that's an interesting um an interesting kind of thing because I think different co-writers work differently. Like the way we work is actually Anthony lives most of the time he's based in Uruguay. So we're on opposite sides of the world. So we use Skype. Um, we've used Skype for years and we jump on Skype. We, we talk through everything and then one of us will go off and start writing and get to a point where the other one then takes over or goes back over that and feeds into the process so it's very much um like yeah we're both kind of working on the sort of script or the outline or whatever document we're working on we're working on all the time um and flip flipping backwards and forwards between us but i love co-writing because i just think it's great to say things out loud to have someone to bounce off writing can be a really lonely process if you're just you sitting there in a room on your own and you know if you get stuck on your own in your own head having somebody else that you can jump on skype with and just throw ideas around or they say something that inspires you for me it's great and and uh, maybe one day i'll write on my own but for now I, I really enjoy the experience working with someone else so i recommend it if people <laughs> people are you know not enjoying writing on their own <laughs> Well, I am usually that person who's kind of writing alone. So I'm always very interested in hearing about how writers work together. So how, how was that process for you? Were you, you said you wrote separately and then rewrote each other's work. So were you kind of like saying, oh, why have you kind of changed that bit or anything like that? Well, Anthony is very, very uh, easygoing, which helps. So, um, He's not precious. I mean, obviously, if you've been working on something for ages and then someone else rips it out, then obviously you might have some feelings about that. But th there's never anything taken personally. And I guess because I direct the films um, and Anthony, Anthony has this understanding, I think, and th one of the reasons I feel it works really well is that he's he really understands that I need to be able to see and trust everything in the script. So he's often working for that for me, which is amazing. And I realize how lucky I am to have found such a brilliant collaborator in him. Um, so it's generally more likely that I'll rip something out um, or rewrite something than the other way around. Um, but I think that's just the nature of being the director. And it would be the same if a director was working with a writer sol solo that often, you know, a director would do a director's pass of the script to take it to that place where it's a shooting script and they can sort of see it playing out on screen. Um, but then, you know, equally like in, in Sensor, for example, there was a character who we really, struggled to write he was really difficult to write and in the end he got ripped out of the script and for both of us you're like god we spent so much time really sort of blood sweat and tears going over this character and really trying to figure it out and i even i even workshopped those scenes with actors and 
you're trying to get to the crux of it and then you realize actually the script the story doesn't need it you know and that can be hard but it's all part of the process and there's that there's that um you know saying kill your darlings isn't there or or there's another way of thinking about it that you know that there can be an umbilical cord to the project something that makes you actually access that project but it might not serve the story it might be the thing that serves you getting into the script but you might actually need to throw it out at some point whether that's in the writing process or the edit um it's all part of serving the story and making the best film at the end of the day so even though i i do myself write alone uh, when i do work with directors and producers the one rule we always try to follow is if one of us doesn't like something we don't get too hung up on it or precious about it we just keep working on it until we come up with something that we both do like i'm I'm assuming that was something very similar in the way you work with anthony yeah yeah absolutely yeah it's always like wanting to feel excited about what's on the page and um make sure that it's a scene that's kind of driving the story forwards and functioning but also feels like something you want to see happen on screen ultimately so when you were developing the idea for center did you have a an idea for a story area and an issue you wanted to explore first in terms of you wanted to explore the idea of censorship and the video nasty era and then you came up with characters and a storyline that allowed you to explore that idea or did you come up with the characters and the story first the character came first but it wasn't a woman to start off with it was a man um so it was character first in that i wanted to explore a film censor and i was interested in exploring our relationship with violent material and the idea of a character who was perhaps questioning their own moral compass or that perhaps thought maybe deep down they were a bad person that was my starting point so i started to read about censorship through the ages in the uk and i quickly landed in the video nasty era because it felt like all of the things i wanted to explore in the character were were echoed in what was going on around video nasties at that time this idea that um vhs horror was going to turn every turn society into monsters and the social hysteria and moral panic around video nasties um but then also you've got this really rich political backdrop where you know art is being used as a scapegoat for politics and what the government's doing and so it was a no brainer from that perspective and then you've got the added bonus of i absolutely love these films from this era era i'm a child of the 80s i grew up on a diet of vhs so you've got those elements that are really exciting to explore as well and and for me it felt like that period it's such a um a key or interesting rich time in uk in uk history and in our the uk's relationship with horror it's a really influential period of horror films most of these band films or many of these band films have been remade now the remakes obviously aren't as good but <laughs> um so it was really character then place and period and and then there were questions that anthony and i would kind of be grappling with i always knew i wanted to explore both self censorship and censorship in film and i knew that i wanted to find a part a, a, like a memory or a moment in the character's childhood that they couldn't access that the that her brain had censored on her behalf so there were kind of key things that i was trying to find in the story and then it was really a process of writing and exploring where you try something out and you you're like that's fine but it's not it and then you land on the thing that really you like yeah that's it it really clicks and so things like her sister having disappeared when she was a child early on on in the very very early drafts the sister was actually an adult and she was an actress and she'd gone on set and lost contact with the main character and it was through ideas research writing that i thought actually maybe this is the memory that she's you know you're trying to find that memory maybe 
it's a memory and she can't remember the day that her sister disappeared. So um, it didn't all come in one go. It was really a slow process and connecting the dots and understanding the themes um, and what you want to be exploring, what excites you, and then figuring out those connect the connective tissue between those themes. Um, that was really the process. Now I can look back and think that was really exciting and it all makes sense. But obviously the reality of being in that process is you feel like you're blindfolded and grappling for something to hold on to. But I think going through that more and more is really is great because you start to realize that's just all part of writing um, and you can relax into it a little bit as much as you can into writing anyway. So with character creation, a lot of textbooks and screenwriting courses tell you you have to do these huge elongated character profiles and backstories before you start working on the script. Uh, but some writers prefer just to discover the characters as they're going and through the process of writing the screenplay. So with the character of Enid, who I did think was a very interesting and complex character, did you discover her more just as you were working on the script? Yeah, I think um, obviously, you know, I, I mean, not obviously, but I came up with the idea for the film quite a long time before we started writing it because I was I made Nasty in between as well. So we were thinking about her. She wasn't called Enid then. I think she was called Linda at that point. Um, we were thinking about her for a long time and through that she starts to form at the beginning, you don't really know the character. And then through the ideas developing and the decisions and going down, a, a, you know, the wrong alley and coming back and trying things out, they start to take shape. But I also don't think that stops until you've, you know, shot the film, really, because that character development continues once you meet the actor uh, that you're or cast the actor. And then the work with the actor is, I always think that casting is like choosing that version of the character. Every actor is going to bring a different version and it's about deciding which version you feel is right for the, for the story. And so that decision is huge in, in character. Um, and then the way you involve the actor and work with the actor and develop the character further and the way that they make choices on screen um, that take the writing to the next level is all part of that journey. So um, I, I do like knowing about the character, uh, particularly with Sensor, Enid's backstory really was important, obviously. Um, but the, the, the way that her personality and her behavior had been shaped through the events of her life were important you know, they made her, I think, become more specific, um, which was helpful. And they're also helpful things to talk to the actor about at that stage. So I think for me, backstory is a really useful thing, but it doesn't, again, it, it's an evolution. Um, you don't have to know it all right at the start. So through Enid's character journey in the story, was there a particular point of view that you wanted to put across about the effect that uh, watching those video nasty films had on people? Or did you want the audience to make up their own minds about the effects that uh, watching those kind of films either had on people or didn't have on people? I think I was more interested in the writing process in, in social hysteria and and exploring that aspect of it because um, I don't I don't believe that censorship is a healthy thing and I think that that is there in the film if you look um, what Enid is self censored and she works as a film censor and I don't want to give away too much in case people haven't seen the film but I don't think either of those things turn out particularly well for her. Um, so the attitude towards censorship um, is very present in the film, but it's not stated in this very obvious overt way. Um, it's not like a black and white kind of, I'm going to give you all the answers at the end sort of film. Um, 
And I was really interested in the moral hysteria that can come off the back of something like that and how that is uh, poten- potentially more damaging than than the films themselves um, because it was during the period. And so, you know, you're trying to, in a way, Enid, the character became like, um, it's like she encapsulated moral hysteria uh, social hysteria, moral panic. She kind of ended up encapsulating so much of the era in who she was, even right down to like the theme of blame and responsibility, which was going around at that period, you know, who's to blame for the bad things that happen in the world. And everybody's pointing the video, pointing the finger at video nasties. And Enid's, you know, blaming herself, feeling blamed by her parents feeling blamed by her her work, her boss, the press, you know, so you're trying to identify those things and and channel them into the character. Um, so I, I do have an attitude towards these things for sure, but I think the way I want to communicate them is not heavy handed. Um, so, so they're there, they're laced in. Um, yeah. The thing I remember most about that era and growing up in the whole kind of time of of video nasties and all these films being banned was actually how kind of intriguing and cool the the censorship made horror films. I mean, I remember my best friend at college had a bootleg copy of The Evil Dead that was like a copy of a copy of a copy and was almost unwatchable. And, you know, I remember going to see... The Exorcist at um, at a cinema in Notting Hill, um, while it was still banned um, because of the licensing laws, they were able to show it. And just going going in the middle of the night to kind of watch a banned movie at the cinema was this really exciting experience. And I I think you know like for myself and I think for a lot of people who grew up in that era, the the censorship actually gave us a lifelong love of horror films because even though we couldn't actually watch any of the films at the time ourselves, it just made the film seem cool and kind of intriguing. So, so do you think the censorship had the opposite effect to what was intended? Is it actually made people want to watch the films rather than not seeing them? Yeah, I do. I, I love the idea that, um, that the, the band list became a holy grail for the horror fan. You know, it was like, don't watch this film. It's going to deprave and corrupt you. And the horror fan goes, oh, my God, that sounds amazing. I want to watch that. So in so many ways, many of these films, which were so random in terms of what was put on this list, they're all so different. You've got something like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and then you've got something like Gestapo's Last Orgy, or was it, you know, you've got, and then you've got, um, you know, The Witch Who Came From The Sea. They're, they're, they're so different. Um, and, and I don't think a lot of these films would have been remembered if they hadn't have been banned. So it was brilliant advertising for these films. I think, yeah, they did a, a huge favor in that sense for raising you know, the profile of some of these movies. Frozen Scream, for example, was wrapped up in the video nasty list. It's one of my favorite bad films. Like it's, it's bad, bad, you know, it's, it's like really, brilliantly clunky filmmaking but I love it I've probably watched it about eight or nine times I'd never know about that film if it wasn't on the video nasties list so yeah and what what more do you want when you're a kid than to be told not to do something (laughs) and then you really want to do it so backfired (laughs) and with so many of these films available to watch now I I wanted to ask about how much research uh, you and Anthony did, because I I guess the question with research is really how much to do, because you need to do a certain amount in order for your story to feel authentic. But if you start doing too much research, then it can start to seem like procrastination and you're just kind of watching movies or researching when really you should be getting on with working on the script. So how much research did you and Anthony do? And at what point did you know that you had done enough and you needed to start writing? Uh, We did some really fun research for this, actually. Quite early on, we went to the BBFC. I I managed to get hold of an examiner, a censor who worked, well, now they're called compliance officers, but um, 
let's call them sensors for, for ease. I managed to get hold of a sensor from the BBFC and contacted them and said, could we come in and talk to them? And we probably went in there over the years, like four or five times to talk to them and also to uh, look at their archive where you can go in and book out files from films over a certain period over sort of 15 years old or something. So we'd go in and we'd book out for files of say, I spit on your grave, last house on the left, possession, etc., and then go through those files and look at the notes that the censors were doing from at, during that period, which was fascinating because you started to see the different attitudes of these uh, examiners. Like they weren't all going, no, ban this, ban that. Some of them were defending the films and arguing and, and debating in really intellectual ways over, you know, the the kind of monster sex scene in possession or something like that. And it's kind of funny in a way. Um, so we were doing that. I managed to get hold of some film censors from the period and spoke to them, which was great. And then one of them also spoke to Neve uh, when we cast Neve. So I was really keen for her to actually speak to someone who did the job. Um, and then other research was reading about ambiguous loss and listening to first person accounts of people who had lost and never found their family members, which was heartbreaking and um, really fed into, again, you start to see connections between themes because I started to think about how when you lose somebody and you don't know what happened to them, your imagination takes over. You start to imagine where they might be, what could have happened, are they dead, are they alive? And the exhaustion of that, but also the way that that connected to the themes of fiction and reality that I wanted to explore in 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 the film, like the way that, for example, Enid's imagination of filling the gap of the loss of her memory of not knowing where her sister is actually fuels her reality because it shifts her behavior in reality and shifts her actions. And so that relationship, I'd start to see connections in those themes. Um, so, and then obviously watching the video nasties, which is fun <laughs> when you call it work, re-watching and watching the ones I hadn't seen um, and reading a lot of books about the period, you know, Seduction of the Gullible, books on Argento's work, watching interviews with directors and, um, and looking at um, the tabloid articles from the period. I mean, to be honest, it was like the most fun research ever. I really enjoyed it. Knowing when to stop is a tricky one. In hindsight, I don't feel like I ever overdid the research. Um, and all of it feels like it fed into when you come to make the film and you're talking to actors, you're talking to your your crew, that you've got all of that, you know, that you can share with them. Um, nothing felt like a waste, but I think it's making sure that it's not eating into the time where you should be writing. So perhaps it's about allocating a certain amount of time to research in your day or in your week or however you want to do it so that you don't end up using it as a way to feel like you're doing work when you're not actually getting work done. <laughs> And when it came to the writing, what was the hardest scene for you and Anthony to write? The hardest scenes to write were the scenes with the character that we cut from the film. And I think that he, it was because he was a character that in some ways there was exposition in his scenes. The, the film is very much, you know, you're in Enid's perspective, you're in her head. Um, and perhaps there was a fear because Enid doesn't um, communicate openly. She doesn't say anything out loud. She doesn't have her best friend that she goes and tells what she's thinking. She doesn't have a therapist that she goes and talks to that perhaps that character was almost like a crutch of worrying that we needed somebody who would uh, vocalize her past, vocalize what was happening. And so those scenes ended up being more expositional in a way. And then through making the film, we realized that we didn't need that crutch, you know, and actually that became a distraction. Um, so it was it was interesting now in hindsight that there was a reason why they were the hardest scenes to write. And that's because they were expositional 
and because we didn't really need them. But you don't know that at the time. So you shot those scenes and took them out in the edit? Yeah, we were working in the edit and there was just something we were like, there's something, there's too much going on. And one day I just thought, let's, it, uh, the, the actor who played the, the role was brilliant. There was nothing wrong with the scenes. But then when it came to, um, you know, it came to it, I said, let's just try taking him out. And, and we took him out and it was like, ah, we don't need anybody else to be getting us into her head. She's doing that you know, we're doing that with the filmmaking and the performance already. And so it, it it meant we were somehow more in her head without somebody else directing us to that, funnily enough. And can I ask what the budget and the shooting schedule for the film were? Yeah, so the budget was around 1.6 million that came from the BFI Film 4 and Film Cymru Wales and uh, some tax credit um schemes that I don't, my producer would know about. And the shooting schedule was, we did a five week shoot and we had five weeks prep. And were there any particular challenges you faced shooting to that budget and on that schedule? Yeah, I mean, the first challenge is that it's a period film. So the budget is, um, I think a budget on any first feature. I think, you know, in the UK, I know people who've shot their first features on much less and much more money than than we made, but it's all relative. Um, it's all relative to how many locations you have, what are you trying to achieve on camera, how many casts you have. And we had quite a lot of locations. We had a lot of cast. Um, we were shooting a period film. From very early on, I told my producer that I wanted to shoot on film. And she was very supportive and understood the value and the reasons behind wanting, you know, behind us making that decision. Um, that obviously, we had really great support from Kodak and CineLab on that front, um, which helped massively, which made it possible for us to be able to shoot on film. But it is an extra cost. And then on set, you are, as a director, you're obviously then limited by how much stock you have. So you can't just. I mean, time is against you as well, but you can't go for take off to take off to take. Every take costs some more money because it's more stock. Um, so there were, you know, there were big challenges um, in terms of the budget and and then on a practical level in terms of, of the shoot, you know, we were working in multiple locations. So you've got unit moves, obviously, that slow you down. And then uh, we had lots of night shoots and we had lots of sh night shoots in a forest. So obviously, if you don't have a huge budget, you can't afford tons of crew, but you need to light a forest and you need generators and that kind of thing. So I know that that was, you know, for my c cinematographer, it's, you know, it's not a huge challenge for a cinematographer to shoot in a forest, but when you're doing it on not much money and you need light and lights cost money, you know, it, it becomes a challenge. And then there's the practical challenge of like rain and mud, which are your enemy <laughs> when you're shooting. We had a lot of rain and a lot of mud. Um, so I don't think my, my DOP ever wants to shoot in a forest ever again after that experience, but she did an amazing job. So, yeah. And were there any scenes that you didn't get to shoot or that you didn't have the time to film exactly as you ideally would have liked to? No, we we ended up um, shooting a few days pickups and that was because there were things I added. Um, so, for example, we lost that the character that I mentioned um, and that meant that he was part of the inciting incident. So we no longer had an inciting incident. So we had a couple of plot points where I then wrote new scenes. So I wrote um, a, a new scene and we also had the title sequence, which was something we created in the edit and a couple of other things that we were just picking up for, for scenes. Um, so we that was really you know, really lucky that we were able to we were able to do that and that our, you know that we were supported to to pick up those last bits because it made all the difference. 
Yeah, it's interesting that you were talking about wanting it to seem like you're inside the character's head. It's one of the things I, I really liked the most about the film was that it really seemed to have this dreamlike quality. It almost felt like you were experiencing a nightmare that someone was having. So was that a particular quality that you wanted the film to have? Yeah, I'm, that's lovely that you say that because that's absolutely was the intention, this kind of like, you know, psycho trippy sort of horror film where you feel like you're inside a nightmare um absolutely and i mean that's a uh you know a collaboration with all your team to to keep the the audience in the character's head so for example you've obviously got to get a great performer at the heart of that who's going to let the audience in but you know, and one of the great things about Neve Alga is that she ha brings those of empathy to her roles and she she allows us to get into the head of a character, even though even if that character is not saying much. But then when you come to the edit, a lot of the the guiding, you know, if you're watching someone think what you cut to next is going to help the audience access that character's thoughts. So, for example, the memories the flashbacks um of enid and her sister in the forest that was a longer memory that when we came to the edit me and my editor we decided to try breaking that memory up because we realized enid can't remember everything so it feels like it needs to be more fractured and where we peppered that in was a way to guide the audience in terms of what enid's thinking about at that point so in, there's a scene where she's given some information at work about a film that um, may have caused a copycat killing. And we use those memories to guide the audience to think, to understand that she's thinking in that moment about her sister rather than thinking about what her boss is saying. Um, so that kind of thing, the way you shoot the, the actor, obviously, the the intimacy of the camera with the actor and then the way you edit that is key to keeping the audience in the character's head but then also you might have um uh the the sound and the music is really key to that as well in terms of particularly that kind of trippy weird surreal element so some of the techniques that the sound uh designer and the composer were using were with that in mind so for example, we use uh, something called a transducer, which is where you can uh, process sound through an object. So the sound team took, for, for example, all the dialogue from the dream sequences and the later scenes, and they put the, the sound through a piano wire sculpture, which was this 50 foot piano wire, and then used a contact mic to record that back. And what it does is create this really surreal soundscape. So it uh, then we'd mix that into the more normal traditional sounding dialogue. So you've got this really surreal dreamlike sound space underneath the normal sound. And again, with the music, you know, Emily, um, the uh, composer, Emily Lebanese Farouche, she used her voice a lot and she processed that in very specific ways. And then it's about how you introduce certain synth sounds and um, the way that we then mixed those sounds and uh, merged the music with the sound design, all of those things really, really add to that um, surreal journey for the audience. And did you storyboard every scene? I shot lists. Um, I tend to storyboard scenes that I either think would be useful because there's lots of action or a stunt, but based on my budgets um in my life i've never had the budget to storyboard and tend to not have the time to do the storyboard for the whole film myself so i use uh, shot lists and floor plans to prep um i do think storyboards are really helpful though so in future i'd love to use them more but it's just not been possible all the time for for yeah maybe one day I'll afford a storyboard artist. And what would you say was the hardest scene to shoot? My God, that's a good question. Um, I think the scene 
the scene I, I'm not sure if it's, that there were scenes that I definitely was thinking about more in, in the run up to them that I was more anxious about. Um, for example, the end scene, I was, and that was for various reasons because you've written into the script that it's like a glorious sunny day and uh, you're hoping that that's going to happen on the day. And then the amount we had to get through for that scene was a lot because in that, I'm not going to give away again too much, but in that you have um, some of the setups, you've got, you're shooting twice because you're doing two different versions. And even if one version is only a few frames, you still have to, we had to have the cast go off and change their costume. We redress the background, we change the lighting and then I had to keep the camera locked off and then shoot again. So the time that takes is stressful because you're just like, this is still one shot, but you're taking a lot longer to, to prep in between to, to do that, um, to change. And you can't come back to that because you need the camera locked off. So you have maybe four shots where you have to have your cast go off and change their costume and everything. So that was quite stressful, but it was all fine. And I'm so pleased with the result and it all worked and it was worth it. Um, and then similarly, early on, the um, the scene with all the censors sitting around the table in the census office, I remember thinking, oh, my God, I've got six actors sitting around a table. And, you know, those scenes where you have lots of cast in the same room and you want to make sure you're giving everybody the right attention and good notes and covering everyone. But that, again, was fine. And that was partly because I had an amazing, lovely, lovely cast who, uh, yeah, were just a dream. Um, so you can build these things up in your head, but I don't think that's a bad thing because as long as you listen to that and you interpret that as being prepared, um, rather than just stressing out and worrying, you actually use that energy to prepare to be on set. I think it's fine. Um, you know, and again, like whenever you've got stunts or special effects, again, those are stressful scenes because of the time it takes to set those things up. But there's no avoiding that. And a very distinctive element of the film is the use of different aspect ratios. How did that idea come about? Yeah, it was an idea that was born in Nasty. Um, and it was about me wanting to shift from uh, reality into fiction in a way. And so I loved using it in Nasty and it felt really appropriate for Sensor because uh, as well as the uh, sort of noting between fiction reality um i also felt like enid's on this very singular single point of view journey you know one of the visual motifs or was her kind of going down tunnels and corridors and this idea of somebody who's becoming very blinkered in in their journey and in their perspective so it felt like that creeping aspect ratio was oppressive and represented that sort of singular point of view and that uh, that blinkeredness um in terms of how we worked it was in the script you know there was a, a point in the script which was noted from this point we slowly creep in to a four by three aspect ratio and then there was a point where we reached that aspect ratio during the edit we decided to jump out of the of the four by three and then cut back to it so luckily we'd shot the film with the, the full aspect ratio and that was also partly because we wanted we there's always that worry that a financier or someone might come along and say that's you're not allowed to you know you don't, you can't do that and you know to hopefully you wouldn't get that and hopefully even if they did say that you'd be able to convince them but it felt like the safe option but also if you're shooting with when it's a creeping aspect ratio, you can't work out, you can try and gauge how long a scene's gonna be and how much that aspect ratio needs to creep in, but you can never be certain. And you might end up moving scenes around in the edit or dropping a scene or whatever. So um, that was something we shot full, but we were always had guides as a general guide of what we were seeing to make sure that we were getting everything we needed in frame. 
And when it came to editing, uh, you mentioned that you took out the scenes featuring one of the characters. Were there any other scenes that you took out? No, uh, I don't think there were. An, oh, there was a scene um, with, yeah, there was a scene in the third act that um, actually is still there in the film because we used it in a different place. Um, but there was a scene where Enid meets Alice Lee and there's a scene on the bed. Um, and we basically just found that it slowed the pacing down. So in the edit, we realized we didn't need it. So we took it out and then we repurposed that in another place. So um, that was something that came out. And then uh, the um, scene with, sorry, the title sequence, that was something we, my editor and I constructed. Um, so it was off the back of a note it, from, from a test screening with the financiers. And somebody had said that they felt like they wanted the idea of video set up and the era and we and so we thought let's put a title sequence together that serves that and it worked really well and there was already some of the clips of the videos that you see playing in there they were already in the script because we had a sequence where Enid walked down a corridor and and looked into rooms or we saw people in rooms you know other senses watching films so we just made that all part of the title sequence and added to it and embellished it and um included voiceover as well so my editor went through getty and he's a big video nasty fan too so he went through doc documentaries from the era and 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 between us we kind of grabbed a bunch of uh voice voiceovers and then we um, rewrote them and recorded them in ADR with actors that came in. So that was a whole build of something new, but it was great because it, it gives context to the period and what's happening and the backdrop for people who maybe aren't as aware. The film premiered at Sundance this year. What was that experience like? Different to what it would, would have been like if we weren't in the middle of a pandemic because it was a remote Sundance. So it was amazing. Um, but I had to keep trying to stop myself thinking about what it could have been if if we'd have been able to go and the, that amazing experience. But Sundance just, yeah, I didn't know how uh, key and important that would be for me when we got that invite. I mean, obviously, it's amazing to get into Sundance and be invited. But, you know, the interest in the film from the US and you know, how that's opened things up for me um, kind of more internationally has been really, really exciting. But the event itself, it actually was great because that weekend everybody was just sitting in their living rooms and I was really worried that we weren't going to, that we weren't going to find out what people thought because you don't have that interaction with the audience. You don't sit, you want to sit in a room and hear people reacting and speak to them afterwards but people were really all over social media with their very positive responses. And um, we, I just engaged with people online instead and that was amazing. And I think because it was remote, we ended up getting a lot more eyes on the film off the back of Sundance. So in a weird way, I think it was, there, was some, there were a lot of positives to take from, from how it played out, but Obviously, I would have loved to have actually gone to the world premiere of my debut feature, but there were other things at play in the world. So, Finally, can you tell us what you're working on next? Yeah, um, I'm working on a few features, um, developing a, a, a number of films. But the one, one film that has been announced is a, an adaptation of a short story called Things We Lost in the Fire, which is by an Argentinian author called Mariana Enriquez. And um, I'm partnering with um, a really brilliant producer called Rodrigo Texera on that, who has been involved in amazing films like Call Me By Your Name and The Lighthouse and Francis Hart and has worked with amazing directors. So it's a real pleasure to be working with him. So Anthony Fletcher, who I co-wrote Sensor with, we are, me and him are, uh, you know, starting to write that and adapt that. Um, so... Yeah, that and some other projects that I can't talk about yet. Well, congratulations on Sundance and on Sensor, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. 
Thank you so much for watching this episode of Center Frame Interview. Be sure to watch Prano Bailey Bond's film Sensor on the big screen at the UK Film Festival. You can get a 50% discount if you sign up to our mailing list and enter our promo code when you buy the tickets. Visit our social media to learn more and to get the latest updates, visit centerframe.com. Thank mm -hmm. you.